London, the capital and largest city in England and the United Kingdom, one of the two top-level global cities in the world, along with New York City, London is seen as having a tangible effect on global socioeconomic affairs. In the 1940s, London saw a great deal of destruction in the city due to bombing campaigns by the Germans. As the city started to recover from the war, they held the 1948 Summer Olympic Games at the original Wembley Stadium. A year later, they would catch one of the most ruthless serial killers the country had ever seen. John Hay decided that it would be easier to just steal than to work for his money, but people started reporting his theft, so he came up with a new plan that would keep his victims quiet, permanently. This is Monsters. John Hay was born on July 24, 1909, in Stamford, Lincolnshire, United Kingdom. His parents were John and Emily Hay, and they soon moved to East Riding in Yorkshire. John Sr. was an engineer, and his parents were members of a conservative Protestant sect called the Plymouth Brethren. The Plymouth Brethren were formed in Dublin in the late 1820s and believed in sola scriptura, which is translated to scripture alone. They believed that the Bible was the supreme authority over and above any other source of authority. Outside the church, the Hayes were viewed as religious fanatics, particularly John Sr. He built a 10-foot-high fence around their house in order to keep the outside world out. John was taught that he was constantly being watched by a higher power and wasn't allowed to experience any sort of outside entertainment. He spent his youth inside his home, listening to Bible stories and playing the piano. John Sr. was so afraid of the evil of the outside world that he wouldn't let John play outside with anyone else. John Sr. had a bluish birthmark on his head, and he told his son that it was the mark of a sinner, and that he got it because he misbehaved as a child. This kept John living in fear of receiving a similar mark. Through John's youth, his fear kept him in line, staying inside, practicing the piano. At night, the fear would manifest into intense nightmares. When John was a teenager, he started testing the limits more and more, and his parents allowed him to do a number of things that they deemed sinful. I couldn't find any reference to what those activities specifically were in this case, but they were most likely things like reading secular books or listening to the radio. Some fundamentalist religions were so strict that playing cards were seen as sinful. When the bluish mark of sin never appeared on his head, John realized that his father had lied to him. Once he realized that he could actually get away with sinning with no real punishment, he began diving deeper into the sinful outside world. When John graduated from school, he became an apprentice at a car manufacturer, but he absolutely hated being dirty, so he quit after a year. Then he bounced around from job to job, working as an office clerk, an insurance underwriter, and in advertising. When he was working, he was successful at anything he did. He earned enough to purchase a pricey red Alfa Romeo, but the problem was that John just didn't like working for his money. It seems he continually changed jobs in order to find the easiest way to make money, but he soon realized that the easiest way to make money would be to just take it from people. Duh. In 1934, when John was 25 years old, he stopped going to church and he began making choices that his parents didn't agree with. Still, they supported him and he still lived at home with them. He met a 21-year-old woman named Beatrice Hamer, who went by Betty, and the two quickly got married. They lived with his fundamentally religious parents, which must have been a blast. John decided that working for someone else was not to his liking, so he started up his own business, a business where he forged vehicle documents. So you and your new bride are living with your very religious parents, and you decide this is the place to start a criminal enterprise? Why not? In October of 1934, just three months after his wedding, he was arrested for forgery and sentenced to 15 months in prison. Betty filed for divorce in November, but she was already pregnant. She gave birth to a daughter while John was in prison and gave her up for adoption. John never got to see his baby. He saw Betty one more time when she visited him in prison and he told her that they had never been legally married because he had already been married to another woman. That's not true. Betty was John's first wife, and their marriage was likely perfectly legal. 
It's not known why he would tell her that. Betty soon moved away and never saw John again. When John was released from prison, he continued living in his parents' house and again he started his own business, but this time it was a legal venture. He and a partner started a dry cleaning business which ended up being very successful and things were starting to look up for John. That was until his partner died in a motorcycle accident and he liquidated the business. It's not entirely clear why he couldn't continue the business on his own. Maybe that would have been too much work for John. Once the dry cleaning business was closed, John moved to London. Once he was out of his parents' house, they decided they no longer wanted anything to do with him. He had been married to a woman who didn't share their faith. They got divorced and she put their baby up for adoption. That was on top of John going to prison for fraud. The lifestyle of their only child was no longer something they could tolerate. In London, John began working for a man named William McSwain. William was from a wealthy family and owned a local amusement park. John began working as a chauffeur, and since he had experience with machinery, he also began repairing the machines around the park. Because they both had similar interests, William became close with John and introduced him to his parents, the source of William's wealth. John and the family grew close, but again, John wanted easy money, so he quit his job and started his third business. This time, business basically meant outright scam. John claimed to be a lawyer and used the name of a reputable firm to secure clients. Then he told the clients that he had a large estate that he was going to liquidate, and he was offering shares of the proceeds for a fee. People would bring him checks for the fee, which he would cash before disappearing and starting all over again in a different part of London. The longer this went on, the more complaints police received and they eventually tracked John down. This time, John was sentenced to four years in prison. When his time was up, he was released, but he wasn't out for long. He stole some property and tried to lie his way out of it, but with his current record, he wasn't believed and he was sentenced to another 21 months in prison. John used this time behind bars to develop a plan to take people's money without getting caught. The most obvious answer was to leave no witnesses. John resided to the fact that, when he was released from prison, his new plan would be to murder the people that he stole from. His initial plan was going to be to target older, wealthy women. He was decent looking and quite charming, so he figured he could charm his way into their lives, kill them, and steal their money. Still, that plan would leave a body, and though they wouldn't be able to rat him out, they still could get him caught. While in prison, he spent time working in the metal shop and learned about sulfuric acid. With this knowledge, he believed he solved his problem of what to do with the bodies. While still in prison, he would use mice as test subjects, calculating how long it took for the bodies to completely dissolve. He used this information to calculate how much acid he would need to completely dissolve a human and how long it would take. Once released in 1943, John took an accounting job with an engineering firm and slowly prepared to put his plan into action. He eventually rented a workshop on Gloucester Road where he placed a 40-gallon barrel and stocked it with concentrated sulfuric acid. In the summer of 1944, John ran into William McSwan and William was so excited to see him that he insisted on having him come with him to his parents' house. Donald and Amy McSwan were happy to see John and they discussed with him the recent property investments they had made. John saw this as an opportunity to finally put his plan in motion. On September 9th, John invited William out for a drink and then convinced him to come take a look at his workshop. Once inside, John hit William over the head with a lead pipe and then slit his throat. According to John's later confession, he drank a cup of William's blood as he bled out. Then he placed his friend's body into the barrel with sulfuric acid. John returned to the workshop the following day to check on the body and he was pleased to find that the barrel was filled with nothing but a lumpy sludge. He poured it all down a floor drain and moved on to the next part of his plan. John went to see Donald and Amy and told them that William had fled the area so he wouldn't be sent to war. This story was believable because William was terrified of being sent to war. In 1939, he had registered as a conscientious objector, but he received call-up papers in 1941. After that, he began moving around constantly in order to evade authorities. Due to this history, Mr. and Mrs. McSwan didn't question John's story. He spent the better part of a year sending them letters that were supposedly from their son as he worked his way through his plan. 
John went to the McSwan's house on July 2, 1945. He also hit them over the head with a pipe and then slit their throats. He claimed to have drank their blood as well. He had already prepared two barrels of acid in his workshop, and he quietly transported both bodies there and placed them in the barrels. John went to their landlord and told her that the McSwans had taken a trip to the United States, and she needed to forward their mail to him so he could take care of their affairs. Then he forged Robert's signature and got power of attorney of their properties and finances. He sold one of their investment properties and pocketed 2,000 pounds. He sold another property and their possessions and got another 4,000 pounds. John rented a new workshop in Crawley, just south of London, and moved his acid and barrels there. He didn't want to be in one place for too long. Once his new workshop was set up, John set his sights on his next target. John met Dr. Archibald Henderson and his wife Rose in 1947. They had put their house on the market, and John showed interest in the home as a means of learning more about their financial status. In February of 1948, John told Archibald that he had invented a device that could be useful to him as a doctor. Archibald didn't realize that John had actually stolen a gun out of their hotel room earlier, and as soon as they entered the workshop, John shot him in the head with his own gun. John went back to the Henderson's hotel and told Rose that her husband was sick and she should come to see him. He drove her to the workshop where she too was shot in the head. Their bodies were both placed in barrels of acid. With those pesky human beings out of the way, John went to the hotel and checked out on their behalf, even paying their bill. He took their belongings and was able to sell the valuables for 8,000 pounds. He sent letters to Rose's brother claiming that Archibald had performed an abortion and since they were illegal at the time, he fled to South Africa to keep from being arrested. John did keep the Henderson's dog, though. This time, the acid didn't completely finish the job before John got impatient and dumped the contents in a corner of the property his workshop was on. This workshop didn't have a floor drain like the other workshop had. One of Rose's feet was still partially intact, and John made no attempt to hide it. He seemed to believe that he had developed the perfect plan and couldn't get caught. 8,000 pounds in the late 1940s would be like 300,000 pounds today, which could sustain an average household for a number of years. John had a pretty healthy gambling addiction and preferred expensive things, so he blew through the money pretty quickly and was looking for another victim by early 1949. John had been living at the Onslow Court Hotel in South Kensington where he met a 69-year-old widow named Olive Durand Deacon. John had convinced Olive that he was an engineer and an inventor. She had come up with an idea for fake fingernails that she shared with John. On February 18th, he told her that he had been working on her idea at his workshop and invited her to take a look at his progress. Of course, once she entered the shop, he shot her with the stolen revolver. Her body went into a barrel of acid, and when she was mostly dissolved, John dumped the contents in the corner of the property. John had taken her jewelry and her expensive Persian lambskin coat. He had to take the coat to the dry cleaners first, but he immediately sold the jewelry. Olive was well known, and it only took a few days for a friend, Constance, to grow concerned with her disappearance. For some reason, John approached Constance and told her that he had an appointment with Olive that she missed, and asked Constance if she had seen her, which only increased her concern. When she suggested filing a missing persons report, John offered to give her a ride to the police station. This little gesture would cost John his freedom. Police began looking into her disappearance, and one of the first things they did was look up information about John. Scotland Yard produced a criminal record of theft and fraud that raised red flags with the investigators. They questioned John, but he stuck to his story that he had an appointment with her and she never showed up. This satisfied the police briefly, but they couldn't shake the feeling that John was involved in Olive's disappearance, so they went to take a look at his workshop. Inside, they found the barrels, half-empty containers of sulfuric acid, a rubber apron, a gas mask, and the stolen revolver. In a briefcase, they found a dry-cleaning claim tag for a black Persian lambskin coat, the same type Olive was known to wear. They put out a press release telling jewelry store owners to come forward if they had recently received items that matched Olive's. One store owner contacted the police and presented jewelry that was identified by Olive's family members. 
The receipt had the name Jay McLean on it, but the store owner identified John as the man that sold the jewelry. At the dry cleaners, they confirmed that it was Olive's coat that had been brought in. A pathologist was sent out to John's workshop and immediately identified blood on one of the walls. On the property, he found a mound of sludge and on closer inspection, he found a human gallstone amongst the substance. When the sludge was collected and inspected back at the lab, they identified 28 pounds of human fat, 18 pieces of human bones, a portion of a left foot, three gallstones, a full set of dentures, a lipstick container, and a red plastic bag handle. Olive's dentist was called in and confirmed that the dentures belonged to his patient. By now, John had been brought to the police station for more questioning. Once they laid out all of the evidence they had uncovered, which included documents that connected him to the McSwans and the Hendersons, John started singing. First, though, he asked the detective what the chances were of being released from a maximum security mental facility. It seemed that John was already working on another scam. John told the detective that he had killed all of Durand Deacon, Archibald and Rose Henderson, and Donald, Amy, and William McSwan. He also claimed that he killed three other people that the police didn't know about. He went into detail about each murder, claiming that he drank all of his victims' blood, and that the motive for his murders was a lust for blood. Then he gave vague details about the other three murders, still claiming he killed them so he could drink their blood. John's lawyers tried to get him off with an insanity defense. John told everyone that he only killed in order to drink blood, and as a child he had dreams of blood. Then, in 1944, after a car accident, the dreams resumed. One of his dreams he described, I saw before me a forest of crucifixes which gradually turned into trees. At first, there appeared to be a dew or rain dripping from the branches, but as I approached, I realized it was blood. The whole forest began to writhe and the trees, dark and erect, to ooze blood. A man went from each tree, catching the blood. When the cup was full, he approached me. Drink, he said, but I was unable to move. It's believed that he made up the three additional murders to remove money as a motive. The six confirmed murders clearly showed that they had been carried out solely for money, so he added some random people to try to show he was motivated by drinking blood, hence insanity. He was also under the impression that he couldn't be convicted since there was no bodies. It took the jury just 17 minutes to come back with a guilty verdict. John Hay was found guilty and sentenced to death. In order for him to be executed, he was required to undergo a medical inquiry under the Criminal Lunatics Act of 1884. Three psychiatrists examined John and determined him to not be insane. On August 10, 1949, John Hay was executed by hanging. He was 40 years old. John Hay didn't want to work for his money, so he decided to take it from others, going so far as to murder them so he could freeload without getting caught, ending people's lives all for money, like a true monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to the hotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.